I want to tag this text on this morning, how to overcome the pandemic perspective. How to overcome the pandemic perspective. Uh, we're watching it in the news uh, on the 24-7 news cycle, this COVID-19, also known as the coronavirus, how it has taken our nation and this world by storm. Uh, we know COVID-19 has no respect for person or place. It has no respect for your socioeconomic status, how much money you make, doesn't matter your political affiliation or even your religious affirmation. Outside of the physical effects of the virus, we hear and see people losing their jobs. Uh, many college campuses and schools have suspended their academic calendar. And even our healthcare workers are being sent out to fight the virus without the proper equipment to remain safe and to provide the best care. Uh, because of this worldwide spread, the World Health Organization has categorized COVID-19 as a pandemic, a pandemic. Uh, the word pandemic originates from the word pandemonium, pandemonium. Uh, pandemonium means this. Pandemonium is a state of wild disorder or noisy confusion. Let me say that again. The word pandemic originates from the word pandemonium. Pandemonium means a state of wild disorder or noisy confusion. Journalists and public health officials work to communicate critical information globally regarding the risk assessments and recommendations, but I see a related threat has emerged called a pandemic perspective. What is this? This is a psychological distress resulting from repeated media exposure to the outbreak COVID-19. The American Psychological Association recently posted an article explaining how the global 24-7 news cycle can lead people to inaccurately overestimate the threat to themselves and their own communities. Let me say that again. The American Psychological Association, they recently posted an article explaining how the global global 24-7 news cycle can lead people to inaccurately overestimate the threat to themselves and their communities. In our interconnected society, public health threats can extend far beyond their point of origin. Public health threats lead, like COVID-19 can evolve into fear, they can evolve into anxiety, distress, depression. Uh, this is what we call the pandemic perspective on this morning. It can extend and take root in your mind and in your spirit, producing a state characterized as wild disorder and noisy confusion that can ultimately suppress our faith in God. Let me say that again, the pandemic perspective, it can take root in your mind and in your spirit, and it can produce a state of wild disorder and noisy confusion in your mind and in your heart that ultimately suppresses our faith in God. Uh, it is important that we listen to and heed to the recommendations from the scientists and the doctors and I were government officials whom God has graced with skill and knowledge. Uh, but regarding fear, worry, and anxiety, I must inform you that God has made us to feel and have emotions. Let me say that again. God has made human beings. He's made us to feel and experience emotions. God knows our fragile state. He knows he's not, he's not uh, surprised by our emotions and our fears and our anxiety. God made everything about us. 
some of God's best that we read in scripture experience moments of fear, anxiety, and depression. I can go down the list. David experienced fear, anxiety. Jeremiah experienced depression. Moses experienced some emotional uh, discomfort. But I want to give you assurance that whatever situation or place you find yourself in today, this week, that Jesus understands your weakness and he understands your suffering. I want to encourage you on this morning to let you know uh, that you shouldn't let distress distract you from a God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Let me say that again. I want to encourage you on this morning that you do not let your distress distract you from a God who can do anything but fail. God can do anything but fail. God is there in the good time, in the good days, and God is there in the dark days. One thing I like about God is that he doesn't condemn us for our questions. God doesn't condemn you for your fears. God doesn't condemn you for your anxiety. He doesn't tell you you just need to tough it out. But God knows how to reach down in the deepest, darkest pit of your emotions. God knows how to reach down into the deepest, darkest pit of your fears, your anxiety, your depression, and God has hands that are able to reach down and pick you up and put you on a rock to stand. God can do anything but fail. Psalms 34 and 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. So many people in today uh, dealing with the pandemic perspective, they are crushed in spirit. But I want to let you know today that we have a God, we have a faith, we have a God, we have a man who's able to stand beside us and pick us up and keep us from falling. God can do anything but fail. He's never lost a battle. So God, I want to tell you, encourage you on today that God will never waste the seasons of your suffering, but he will use them in some way, somehow to bring about a purpose to help you and help others and to strengthen your faith. Let me say that one more time. God will never waste the seasons of your suffering, but he will use it in some way, somehow to bring good, to instill purpose, to help others, and to make you stronger. Romans 8 and 28 says, and we know that all things, not just some things, but all things are working together for some good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. I'm so glad that I have a God that doesn't waste my seasons of suffering. I'm so glad that God, he's the God on the mountaintops and he's the God in the valleys. I'm so glad that even in this season, God is teaching us something. God is strengthening us. God is making us better. He's making us bigger. Never would, have ha- never would I have made it if it was not for God. Let's look at the text on this morning. Uh, as we take a deeper look at the text, the historical background in today's text is believed to be related to God's deliverance of Jerusalem from the Assyrians in the time of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a poet and may have written not only this psalm, but also Psalms 47 and Psalms 48. The emphasis in Psalms 46 is on the presence of the Lord with his people. Let me say that again. The emphasis on Psalms 46, our text today, is on the presence of the Lord with his people and the difference it makes when we trust him when overwhelmed with pandemic perspective. I'm going to say that for a third time. The emphasis in Psalms 46 is on the presence of the Lord with his people and the difference it makes when we trust him when overwhelmed with a pandemic perspective. Uh, Let's look at the text on this morning. Psalms 46, one through nine, uh, it uses descriptive phrases to describe what appears to be a traumatic experience in the life of Israel. Psalms 46, one through three, uh, it states that God is our refuge and strength. He's a very present 
help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear? But look at the next descriptive phrase. As though the earth be removed. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though mountains shake and the swelling thereof. That sounds that sounds very descriptive, like a troubling time. Uh, verses one through nine, as we look deeper at the text, verses one through nine are spoken in the third person. That's an English term. Uh, verses one through nine, they are spoken in the third person. Hezekiah is speaking about God. Once again, verses one through nine are spoken in the third person. Hezekiah is speaking about God. But when we look at verse 10, there's a shift in the sentence structure. The sentence structure changes from third person to first person. That means that God begins to speak to his people. Not only does he speak to his people, but God in verses 10 and 11, he gives us two ways, two ways that we can overcome the pandemic perspective. Uh, God gives us two ways that we can overcome the pandemic perspective. Let me give you these two phrases, these two ways, and then I'm going to get out your way. The first way that we can overcome the pandemic perspective is we have to learn how to be still. We have to learn how to be still. Uh, verses 10, be still. Uh, I was thinking about this. I began to wonder and think, could it be? Could it be that God has us in this position? Could it be that God has us in this pandemic position to teach us something? Could it be that God in his mercy and his grace has orchestrated this season to help enhance our faith? And I will focus, could it be? Uh, re remember, pandemic comes from the word pandemonium. Pandemonium means wild disorder or noisy confusion. Uh, I remember when I was around in the first grade, uh, I had a teacher that when the class, when the class was in wild disorder, and when the class was in noisy confusion, when the class was in pandemonium, when the class had a pandemic perspective, you can say uh, our teacher in the first grade, what she would do, she would stand at the front of the class. Uh, she would stand at the front of the class and she would lift her voice and she would say, class, it is time we get in our listening and learning positions. Uh, my teacher, when the class, when, we, when it was noisy uh, and when there was wild disorder in the class in the first grade, the teacher, she would stand at the front of the class and she would lift up her voice and she would say, class, it is now time that we get in our listening and learning positions. Uh, LLP, class, it's time that we get in our listening and learning positions. Uh, maybe... Uh, in this season, God is calling us to get in our listening and learning position. Uh, let me tell you quickly uh, that listening and learning position my teacher would talk about. It, it had four four things that she was calling us to do. The first thing she she meant by she when she said get in your listening and learning position, the first thing she meant was it's time to open our ears to listen. Uh, the second thing she wanted us to do, she wanted us to focus our eyes on the teacher, on the speaker. The third thing in the LLP, she wanted us to focus our brains on the lesson. And uh, the fourth thing, the thing, the fourth thing I want to I want to hang my text on on this morning, the fourth thing our teacher wanted us to do when she said, let's get in our LLP, she wanted us to keep our feet, our hands, and our mouth still. The fourth thing, she wanted us to keep our feet our hands and our mouth still. Uh, like I said, maybe in this season, God has raised his voice. Maybe in this season, God is standing at the front of the class and he's telling us, class, it's time that we get in our listening and learning positions. Class, it's time that you keep your feet, your hands and your mouth still. Uh, I began to think deeper, deeper about this. And I began to think 
that sometimes we can become so busy and so distracted with distractions uh, in our own life. We become ambitious and we, we become so distracted with creaturely comforts. Uh, but in this season, God has orchestrated that everybody, everybody is in a season of a listening and learning position. Uh, could it be that when the government creates policies that harm the least, the last and the lost, could it be that God is telling us, be still, sit down, slow down, pause? Could it be? Could it be that when religious leaders in the United States stand arm in arm and make excuses for a racist, xenophobic, narcissistic, incompetent president, could it be that God is telling us that we need to be still, sit down, pause, you need to slow down? Could it be that when we put more trust in the economy than we place in God's blessed assurance, could it be that God is telling us, slow down, be still, pause? Could it be that when we, when we replace family devotionals with watching our favorite TV shows, could it be that God is telling us to slow down, pause, be still? Could it be that when Christian values and daily prayer are not a priority to people who identify as Christian, could it be that God is telling us, slow down, pause, be still? Could it be that when we spend more time with and pick up more habits from reality TV stars than we pick up from the Jesus that we read about in the Bible, could it be that God is telling us, pause, slow down, be still? Could it be that in this season, God is trying to get your attention? Could it be that God has us in this listening and learning position to fix something in our hearts, to fix something in our minds, to draw us closer to him? You know, we have this social distancing where they want us to keep six feet from our neighbors. But I tell you, this is a time that where we need to get close to God as we can. I may have to keep this distance from my neighbor, but I need to get as close to God as I can in this season. So God is telling us, God is telling us to be still. But when we look at the text also, uh, John Calvin, that great 16th century French theologian, he states that God in this text also focuses his attention toward the enemies of the people of God. Let me say that again. Not only is God telling us to be still, but God is telling our enemies they need to be still. Uh, Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, I come to tell you today that uh, enemies uh, they're not in flesh and blood, but our enemies can often be our fear. Uh, you can have an enemy of anxiety. You can have an enemy of worry. You can have an enemy of stress. You can have an enemy of depression. Anything that steals your peace and your joy is an enemy that's trying to take something that God has given you. Uh, when the enemy of fear, anxiety, and stress and worry begin to overwhelm you, you have to know how to use the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. Uh, we often, we often, we often have a problem. Uh, we often tell God how big our problems are. Well, we need to turn that thing around and we need to tell our problems how big our God is. I remember growing up, I remember sometimes when when we were out of disorder, when we were just moving too quick, uh, our parents would tell us, our mom and dad would tell us, you better sit down and I dare you to move. You better be still and I dare you to move. I feel sometimes in this season, we got to tell fear. We got to tell anxiety, fear, anxiety. You better sit down and be still and I dare you to move. Why do I dare you to move? Because I got the power of God and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Fear, depression, you better sit down and be still and I dare you to move. 
you got to speak that over your family. You got to speak that over your home. You got to speak that over your job. Fear, depression, anxiety, worry, stress. Sit down. And I dare you to move because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We got to know how to use God's word against our enemies. Isaiah 54 and 17 says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Enemy of fear, enemy anxiety, no weapon formed against me can prosper against me. We have to know and we have to proclaim that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want the Lord. He making me, he making me to lie down in green pastures. God leaded me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leaded me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear Listen to this. I will fear no evil for God is with me. My brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you on today that not only is God telling us that we need to be still, we need to seek his face. We need to get closer to him. But God is also speaking to our enemies that our enemies need to be still and we need to dare them be still. And I dare you to move because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Be still. Number one, God is telling us to be still, to be still. Not only us, it's, he's telling our enemies to be still. But let me give you the second point. Uh, we look at verse 10, Psalms 46, verse 10. Uh, God says, be still. But then he says, know that I am God. This is the second way that we can overcome the pandemic perspective. We have to know that God is God. We have to know that. God is God. Number one, you got to be still. Your enemies got to be still. But number two, you have to know that God is God. What does that mean to know that God is God? Uh, we have to know that God is not in competition with COVID-19. Uh, my Bible lets me know that God has no rivals. Nothing compares to God. Nothing is bigger or better than God. Uh, we have to know uh uh, that God is omnipotent. What does omnipotent mean? Omni means all. Potent means powerful. God is all powerful. Nothing is more powerful than God. So God is letting us know, hey, I'm, I have all power in my hands. What does it mean to know that God is God? It means that God is omnipresent. Omni means all Present means he's everywhere. That means God is everywhere. You can't put God into a box. Uh, you can't you can't put God into some type of captivity. God is everywhere at the same time. Anywhere you need God to be, God is right there. Uh, what else does it mean to know that God is God? It means that God is omni benevolent. Omni means all. Benevolent means loving. That means God is all loving. At this time where you may feel like you may have lost your job, uh, you may be dealing with financial struggle, I want to encourage you that God loves you and God has a way for you. God has provided for you. He's going to bless you in ways that you can't even see right now, but God is omnibenevolent. He's all loving. God has not forgot about you. What else does it mean to know that God is God? It means that he is omniscient. Omni means all science, means knowing. God is omniscient. That means he knows everything. Nothing is outside of God's knowledge. So we have to know that COVID-19, this pandemic, uh, because God is omniscient, COVID-19 did not catch God by surprise. No, no, no. COVID-19 did not catch God by surprise. Before the foundations of the world were laid, God knew, because he's all-knowing, he's omniscient. God knew that in 2020, you, me, your brother, your sister, your mama, and your daddy, he knew that we all was going to be in this position in 2020. God knew it. God knew it. Uh, God knew that... Uh, he, he knew that we were going to be facing these fears, but he came to let us know. He's coming to let us know this morning that we can overcome this pandemic perspective. One thing, one thing I like about God, 
is that nothing is outside of his control. He knows everything. Uh, let, let me break that down for you. When you look at the ocean and you look at the waves, uh, the waves, they come in and then they go out. They come in and they go out and they do this all day. Uh, but the good thing is the, the waves, they have a point where they cannot cross. The Bible says God has marked off the waters that they can only go up to so point or to a certain point. I come to let you know that COVID-19 can only go to a certain point. COVID-19 can only get to a certain point and then it has to recede. It has to go back. Why? Because God is in control. God is in control. We have to know that God is God. Let's move down to verse 11. It says, God says, because I am God, I need you to know that I will be exalted. I come to encourage you this morning that in this season, God will be exalted. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't have all the answers to the questions. That's not my position, but I have a God who knows and he lets me know that he will, through every situation you find yourself in, he says, I will be exalted. Verse 11, he also says, because I am God, I need you to know that the Lord of hosts is with you. God says that in this pandemic perspective, I want to encourage you that I'm with you. God is telling us that he's with us. And I like Romans 8 and 31. I like what Paul says. Paul says, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for you, if God be for you, who can be against you? Who's bigger than God? Who's better than God? If God be for me, if God is with me, who can be against me? God has never lost a battle. He's never lost a patient. God is good all the time. The next thing, verse 11, it says, oh, because God is God, we have to know that God uh, the God of Jacob is our stronghold. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. What does that mean? Stronghold means defense. That means God is a defense. God has protection around us. You may not be able to see it, but God has protection around us. There's a song that the uh, Reverend Clay Evans, that he used to sing uh, all night and all day. I got angels. They keep on a watching over me. I come to encourage you on today that all night and all day, God has his angels encamped around you as a defense, as a stronghold around your mind and around your body. COVID-19 is not going to take us out. When we learn how to be still and when we learn how to trust and know that God is God, that God is he will give us strength to overcome our fear and our anxiety and our depression. Uh, that if we put our trust and our faith in him, God has a hand that's able to reach down and pick us up. When we put our trust in him, we can know that God is a very present help in our time of need. When we know that God is God, we can pray and we can sleep at night and we can rest and we can relax because we know God hears our prayer. Two things, how to overcome the pandemic perspective. You have to first learn how to be still. You have to learn how to be still. And then you got to learn how to tell your enemies, fear, anxiety, be still. And I dare you to move. That's number one. Number two, you have to know that God is God. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's omnibenevolent. God is all powerful. He's all knowing. He's everywhere. He's all loving. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, as I come to my close, I want to encourage you with this, that COVID-19, COVID-19 uh, is it's a bad disease, but it's not the greatest disease that we face. Uh, COVID-19 is not the greatest disease we face. It's not the greatest pandemic we face. Uh, the greatest pandemic, the greatest disease that we face is sin, S-I-N. That's the greatest disease. Why is uh, has sin the greatest disease? Because sin has the ability to hijack your mind and it causes eternal death, uh, eternal death. Uh, but I'm glad because of this disease, God 
instructed Moses. Uh, he instructed Moses to put together a clinical trial. I don't know if you're watching the news, but that's what they're talking about, clinical trials for this disease called COVID. But I come to let you know, God told Moses, this disease called sin, he said, Moses, I want you to go down there and I want you to prepare a clinical trial uh, to see if we can deal with this sin problem. Moses, I want you to create a research study to deal with this thing called sin. And so the Bible tells me that Moses, he put together a clinical trial. Moses got some bulls and Moses got some goats. It's there in the Old Testament. Moses got some bulls and, and some goats and Moses began to shed the blood of the bulls and goats. And, and Moses tried to see if the blood of bulls and goats, if it could handle our sin. Uh, but Moses found out that uh, the blood of bulls and goats, his clinical trial, he found out that it wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough to deal with the sin disease. So God looked around heaven. God looked around heaven and he was searching for somebody to go down there and help mankind deal with this disease called sin. My Bible tells me that the son of God lifted up his hand and said, Father, prepare me a body that I may go down and redeem man from this disease called sin. The Bible tells me in John, John 3.16 that God sent his son. Yes, Jesus came down here, rolled himself in flesh, and Jesus died. He died on the cross on Friday. He died on the cross on Friday. They tell me that they put him in a borrowed tomb. He stayed there all Friday night. My Jesus stayed there all Saturday night. But my Bible tells me that early Sunday morning, my Jesus got up with all power in his hands that he defeated this sin problem that we have. And now we have access to a cure and that access is in the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm glad this morning, I don't know about you this morning, but I'm glad in the midst of everything, in the midst of this pandemic perspective, I'm glad that Jesus lives. I'm glad that Jesus lives because Jesus lives, I can face tomorrow. Because Jesus lives, all my fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future, my life is worth the living just because my Jesus lives. But the story doesn't stop right there, my brothers and sisters. We have a cure for this thing called sin. When you are infected with this thing called sin, we have a cure in the blood of Jesus. But the story doesn't end right there. When Jesus got up from that grave, he told his disciples, it's expedient. That means it's necessary that I go back to the Father. I go back to the Father. But he says, I'm going to go back, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. How many of y'all need some comfort on this morning? I need some comfort myself. Jesus said, I'm going to go up to the Father, but I'm going to send the comforter back down. He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. That's the third person of the Holy Trinity. Jesus said, it's expedient that I go back up. I got the cure, but it's expedient that I go back up. But I'm going to send you somebody. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And I'm so glad that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit dropped. It dropped in the earth. And I, I just let you, I want to let you know on this morning, the Holy Spirit is our vaccine. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we got a vaccine for this. They're searching and they're looking for a vaccine for COVID-19, but we got a vaccine for the sin disease. We got a vaccine and it's called the Holy Spirit. Yes, my brothers and sisters, have you been vaccinated? The Holy Spirit is a vaccine. It will block against fear. The Holy Spirit is a vaccine that will block against anxiety. The Holy Spirit is a vaccine that will block against depression. The Holy Spirit is a vaccine that will block against stress. The Holy Spirit is a vaccine that will block against sin that tries to overcome you. The Holy Spirit is a vaccine that will block against the fear, the enemy that's trying to attack your mind and your body right now. I'm so glad that Jesus went up, but I'm so glad that he sent down a vaccine called the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for my vaccine. Have you been vaccinated on this morning? The vaccine is available for you. It's available for everybody. There's no shortage of the vaccine. The vaccine can it can it can fill you. 
It can baptize you. It can it can touch you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. You may be watching me right now in the comfort of your home, but the vaccine can be right there. It can be in your heart. The vaccine can be in your mind. When you go to work tomorrow, you can have the vaccine. When you go to the grocery store, you can have the vaccine of the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad that I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I got the cure, but I've been vaccinated. Oh my God, I'm feeling good right now. We have a vaccine. We, you, you don't have to fear COVID-19 because we got a vaccine that can block against all manner of fear, anxiety, depression that you may be facing on this morning. My brothers and sisters, we can overcome the pandemic perspective. We can overcome the pandemic perspective. This isn't going to take you and I out. That's not the plan of God. God is telling us on this morning how to overcome this pandemic perspective. Number one, be still. Be still. You have to turn off your TV sometimes. Sometimes you need to turn off the radio. And then if you got some naysayers that's coming in your house, sometimes you need to learn how to turn them off too. Be still. The second thing is you have to know that God is God. And the big thing I want you to know, COVID-19 can take us, it can kill us, our bodies, but it can't kill our soul. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He shed his blood for the cure of this thing called sin. He didn't stop there, but he sent us the Holy Spirit as a vaccine that it will block against doubt confusion, anxiety, worry, and stress. I don't know about you on this morning, but I feel blessed. I feel like I can run on and see what the end is going to be. I feel and I know that God has plans for me. God has plans for you. Let me tell you this. I see you in the future. I see us in the future and we look much better than we look right now. I don't know how I don't know when, but God is going to get the glory out of this in your life and in my life. Remember, God doesn't waste seasons of suffering. God doesn't waste seasons of suffering. And in this point in our history, God is not going to waste a season. Something good is going to come out of this. As I leave you with this, I want to encourage you with some homework on this week. Do this for me. On this week, I want you to make a pre-COVID-19 priority list. What is that? I want you to list all your priorities that you had prior to this pandemic. I want you to get a sheet of paper and write everything down and put it in order of importance. Write everything down. And then I want you during this season of prayer and fasting, I want you to seek God, earnestly seek God and see how your priority list needs to be adjusted. Some of us, you may have God down low on your priority list. Your job may be at the top of your priority list. But during this season of prayer and fasting, during this learning, listening and learning position, I want you to pray and I want you to reorganize your priority list. So you're going to create a pre-COVID-19 list. And then after prayer and fasting, I want you to create a post-COVID-19 priority list. And this is the list that God is going to use to take you to the next level, that post-COVID-19 list. God is going to use that, that priorities, readjusting your priorities to take you to the next level and the next height in God. Do that for me. A pre-COVID-19 list and then make some adjustments and then make a post-COVID-19 priority list. Amen. I believe God is still God. No matter what we hear or read, God is still in control. This did not catch God by surprise. God is in control. We have the cure for sin and we have a vaccine called the Holy Ghost for protection. Amen, let's pray. Stop what you're doing. If you're with family, I ask that you, you grab hold of your family hand. Let's all touch and agree and let's pray. Let's seek the throne of grace. Gracious Father, as we come before you on this day, Lord, we thank you for your word that was given on this morning. Lord, we thank you that in your word, you show us how to overcome the pandemic perspective. 
Lord, we thank you that you give us strength and that you give us instructions on how to overcome fear, anxiety, stress, depression. Lord, we thank you that you give us instruction that you are God in the midst of this season. You are still God and that you're still in control. Lord, we are thankful, Lord, that Lord, we know that COVID-19 can harm and that it can kill the body. But we know this disease called sin can kill the body and the soul. But Lord, we're thankful that you're giving us a cure. Lord, you're giving us a cure in the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the cure, Lord. We know that only his blood can wash away and cure us from this disease called sin. Lord, we're not only thankful for that, but Lord, we're thankful that you sent us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit as protection, the Holy Spirit as a sanctifier of our lives. Now, Lord, there may be someone that's listening on today. They may not know you in the pardoning of their sins. So, Lord, I ask, Lord, that you give them the strength, amen, to come to you and seek forgiveness and be washed in your blood. Lord, I ask that one, Lord, who is in need of salvation, Lord, that you would save them. Lord, that you will know that their sins, that they will know that their sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and their faith in his blood. Lord, our brothers and sisters who are saved, but they just need a little bit more of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, I ask Lord, that you fill us the more, Lord. Give us more of your spirit, Lord. Lord, give us more of your Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord. Fill us with the fruit of the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Fill us, Lord, with your Spirit, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, we thankful, Lord, that at some point, at some time, Lord, this COVID-19, Lord, it's going to pass over us. And Lord, we're looking forward to the day where we can assemble ourselves in your house. Lord, we're going to praise you like we never praised you before. We're not going to take for granted the assembling of ourselves any longer, Lord, but we're going to assemble ourselves in your house, Lord, in the sanctuary amongst believers, Lord, and we're going to praise you. Lord, we, Lord we're going to be more, more motivated to serve you in service, Lord. Lord, we're going to get more active and involved in church, but Lord, we're going to get more active and involved in evangelizing our neighbors, our co-workers, Lord, we're not going to take for granted, Lord Jesus, your word, Lord, and your plan for our lives in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord Jesus, on this week, Lord, we ask what you, that you be with us, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to share this word with somebody that they may be blessed. Lord, we thank you right now. Lord, we ask these blessings and many more in your son Jesus' name and by the Holy Spirit. Amen.